Okay, this is question number five on the final exam uh, for the fall of 2011. And we're told that we have two types of airlines. We have budget airlines and we have standard commercial airlines. And a consumer advocacy group wants to know if budget airlines have longer delays than standard commercial airlines. I'm underlining that sentence because this is what the research group wants to know. So it might be useful for us to keep that in mind. So they take a random sample of 20 customers who flew on budget airlines and 20 customers who flew on standard commercial airlines during a two-week period. And the analyst from the consumer advocacy group uh, working on the project entered the data into SPSS and gave us two outputs, one for a paired sample and one for an independent sample. And indeed, letter A tells us, or asks us to choose which output we should be using. And there are a couple of reasons that you might recognize why this is an independent samples test. Uh, the first is that we have two separate populations, right? We have the population of airlines uh, for commercial, standard commercial airlines, and we have the population of budget airlines. And so because we have more than one population, uh, this can't be a paired samples test. Uh, the other reason is that our samples are independent of one another, right? The 20 customers who flew on the budget airlines, uh, there's no reason to believe that they are somehow dependent on the 20 who flew on standard commercial airlines. So this is an independent samples test. And so our hypotheses are going to be fairly straightforward. The researchers want to see uh, if the budget airlines have longer delays. So that means that they would have to reject that mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, right? That there is no difference at all. So that's our null hypothesis, that there's no difference. And what they want to see is that budget airlines have longer delays. In other words, the average wait time would be longer for standard commercial airlines, and we're told that budget is group two. So mu1 minus mu2. If mu2 is larger, then that means this is going to be a negative number. So mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero. Letter C says provide the appropriate test statistic and corresponding p-value. So now we know that we're working with the independent samples test output, and we have to decide if we can assume equal variances or not. And we can quickly tell that we can't assume that because my significance, uh, my p-value for Levine's test is less than 10%. And remember the null hypothesis for Levine's test is that the variances for the two groups are equal. Uh, but because my p-value is low, I, I, is lower than 10%, I can't assume that to be true. So I have to work with the equal variances not assumed row. And my test statistic from there is negative 0.573. And my p-value given to me is 0.5703. But notice that this is a two-tailed p-value. So just to make sure I'm getting the right p-value, here is a drawing of the t-distribution. Right Here's the negative t-value and the positive t-value. So what I'm given is both sides. But all I really want is the area to the left, right, from my null, or excuse me, my alternative hypothesis, to the left of my t-value. So I just want half of the p-value that's given, which is 0 0.5703. Divide that by 2 gives me 0.2852. Okay. Letter D says, fill in the blank to correctly complete the sentence. If this study were repeated many times and delays for budget airlines are no longer than those for standard commercial airlines, the analyst could expect to obtain a test statistic value as or more extreme than the one we saw in Part C, what percent of the time? Okay, well, notice that this is just asking you for the p-value, right? It's saying, if, in fact, time and delays for budget uh, airlines are no longer than those for the standard commercial airlines. That's the null hypothesis, right? That there is no difference. So if, in fact, the null hypothesis were true, the probability I would have gotten my test statistic or something more extreme is just the p-value. Indeed, that's the interpretation of what a p-value is. I'm just going to rewrite my answer in part C. 20, or excuse me, since this is written in percentage form, I should say 28.5. 2% of the time. Okay, I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to clear. All right, letter uh, E says that at a 5% significance level, the data are not significant, right? And that's because my p-value was, was 
0.52%. That's uh, definitely larger than alpha, so I'm going to fail to reject. I don't have statistically significant results. And letter F says the research team decides 20 is too small, so they conduct a follow-up study. In the follow-up study, the probability of concluding delays are no longer for budget airlines, or excuse me, are longer, when delays really are longer would be what? Notice that what it's asking you for is the probability of concluding delays are longer. Okay, concluding delays are longer means we would reject the null hypothesis. Concluding delays are longer would be rejecting the null hypothesis. When delays really are longer, in other words, that the null hypothesis is false, right? Uh, so that's what this question is asking you about. The probability of concluding days are longer, rejecting the null hypothesis, when delays really are longer, which means the null hypothesis is false, would be what? What happens if we change the sample size? Well, if you notice, this is just the power of the test. Right? Correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. And when we increase the sample size, our power goes up. Uh, so the probability that we would correctly reject the null hypothesis is larger.